What will your future look like? The job you do today could be different than the jobs of tomorrow. Some see this as a challenge. At UCF, we see opportunity. A chance for you to grow your knowledge and strengthen your skills from anywhere life might take you. With in-demand degree programs and resources for your success, UCF Online can help you prepare for the future and all the possibilities that come with it. From the University of Central Florida's Center for Distributed Learning, I am Tom Cavanaugh. And I am Kelvin Thompson. And you are listening to TopCast, the teaching online podcast. Greetings, Kelvin Thompson. Greetings, Tom Cavanaugh of Earth. That's cool. Um, th so those who may be listening didn't see that, but you did the you did the Spock live long and prosper at me. Yeah, I know. With, with your it, hands. Was, it was it was a one immediately recognizable uh, alien hand gesture that I I knew and had confidence that you'd recognize. There's as really such. only two, right? There's that one, and then there's the the, the Nanu Nanu. Or didn't you you do that, and then you sort of shake hands, if I remember? With the, yeah, that's right. With the with the. Uh, Although I think Robin Williams did kind of like like this, he was like doing a volume uh, knob thing Maybe. around his ears too. Maybe. Nah, 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 nah. Yeah. But then he would kind of handshake with the the Spock. Uh, there's probably Vulcan half salute. the audience have no idea what Nanu Nanu means. That's true. Well, you know that's that's a good opportunity to say that you know we do occasionally we make these weird pop culture references, and on the show notes page. If we throw a few of those down in there, we go look up something so that you got some kind of frame of reference. So if you ever wondered what in the world are those guys talking that's about, a, you can figure it out. That's a deep cut. You can you can go find a link to that deep cut mm -hmm. if you if you need to. So I mm -hmm. imagine this one will have some Mork and Mindy link to, in it. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Pam Dauber's been guesting on NCIS, starring Mark Harmon, her husband. Yeah, it's kind of weird. I'm like I haven't seen her and stuff in a long time. It was kind of cool. Like, I cool. remember, it's Mindy, it's Mindy. <laughs> and you thought this was going to be about online learning. Oh, I guess it could be. <laughs> <laughs> no. But first, it probably has to be about coffee. <laughs> yes, yeah, or NCIS, or Morky or, Mindy, or, or Star something. Trek, or whatever, yeah. uh, sure. Um, yeah, I see you sipping, and mm -hmm. I have here something that you poured me just yes. moments ago. <laughs> something, something that I poured you. That's, so, that's, that's Kelvin, uh, mm -hmm. what's in the thermos? In ye old thermos today, Tom, is one I have been holding in reserve for a while, waiting for a suitable connection opportunity, and in a moment you get to be judge and see if it really was a suitable opportunity. This coffee comes to us by way of our UCF colleague, Dr. Francisca Yanakura, who is, as you know, originally from Latin America, and periodically, as you also know, she has had to travel to Miami through the years on consular business for her family or herself. And on one of those trips a while back, she brought us this coffee. Now, initially, I was kind of excited because I thought the shrink-wrapped coffee brick was from her home country, but it turns out to be a product of Miami, which is fine, you know, come, things can come from Miami, that's all right. That bustling international port city that it I is that you I love. I kind of come from Miami. In you some do. Ways. I know. You're, <laughs> so that's 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 why I figured you wouldn't mind too much. Yeah. But this coffee is called Cafe La Rica, and it's one of several brands from C L R Roasters, which also supplies coffee service to a variety of industries in Miami and beyond. In fact, their website includes a page all about their process, like from the farm and all that. But it, instead of stopping at like the roasting and here, here it is, it keeps on going with much more of an emphasis on commoditization, including freight distribution to their industrial clients they serve. More, more of that than the copies that we quite often talk about. So, and th I should say, you were commenting that it's extra strong. I use the AeroPress on this because this coffee was ground like in an espresso grind, which is really fa fine ground. And I don't have a, a brewing process at home uh, other than the arrow press. So it's a little, it's a little espresso-esque. See. <clears throat> um, How's the coffee? Yeah, uh, well, it's growing on me. Um, <laughs> like mold. But it, it's also growing hair on my chest as I drink it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty strong. <laughs> Uh, but I like it. Uh, yes. So thank you to Francisca. Gracias muchísimo. Uh, I, I'm enjoying it, but um, but I need to find a connection now, right? Well, you could look for one. 
in, yeah. in, you know, in the, so, in the time that we have left. Yeah. Que <laughs> uh, tiempo. Um, so I'm, you, I'm thinking it has to do with the, the commoditization and, would you say, freight? Freight distribution, yeah, yeah, or something yeah, like that. Uh-huh, yeah. um, along those lines, there's yeah. a there's a connection in there somewhere. Yeah, I, I think that's kind of what I was looking for, and then also the international. There's an implication of great distances traveled. That was a, a thing in there too. Yeah, because this episode we're going to springboard uh, from comments that we we mentioned uh, back in episode seventy three when we said that listener. Jerry Dougherty had asked for an episode that focuses on modality, and we said, well, maybe we'll take him up on that, because Jerry had some real deep thoughts about modalities based on his past life and military logistics, and he was using shipping containers and transport as a metaphor for course modality, so that day has arrived. So we're going to kind of talk about intermodal transport as a metaphor for use in digital teaching and learning, particularly what Jerry referred to as intermodal learning. So how's that? Yeah, thanks, Jerry. That's a, I mean, it's such an interesting framework, not one that we would have come up with independently on our own. <laughs> no, <laughs> but it's that's a neat right. suggestion. And let that be a lesson to all you listeners, that if you have we, a neat idea... Yeah, we listen to it. We're desperate for them, so <laughs> send them in. We might actually talk about it. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. yeah topcast at ucf.edu. Send us your, your, your tired, your poor, your... your, your, <laughs> your, your clever. You're, you're clever, yes. Yeah. You're, you're, you're deep and wide suggestions, and we'll get to them. So, Tom, I'm of the opinion that to really get into this discussion, we need to kind of have some kind of a bit of a level-setting primer for okay. our listeners on some key terminology and concepts. So, you know, I've thrown some of those down, and I was thinking maybe we could kind of, kind of connect the dot, leapfrog from one to the other, maybe stop for a second and comment on it, just to kind of lay some back stop to to the conversation before we get into, you know, Jerry's um, assertions and, and we can discuss around that. Does that, does that sound kind of okay? Yeah, probably a good idea because probably not everybody is used to, you know, the ins and outs of military logistics. Yes. So some of these terminology um, things are digital teaching and learning, which I would think most of us, you know, kind of are conversant with, and then some are more intermodal transport related. So how about we start with modes? That's like a shared term, which means different things, right? So in transport, as I had to look this up, modes in transport means container ships, railways, trucks, barges, airplanes. Those are all different modes. So intermodal transport means moving from one to the other of those things. Like a John Hughes Thanksgiving movie. Yes. Planes, trains, and automobiles. <laughs> that's like, that's true. Yeah. I did not know that was John Hughes. Yeah. Is that right? Huh. Yeah. Go figure. Which I always get confused with Throw Mama from the Train because they both have trains in the title. Dif- different movie, but also yeah. good. Yeah, sure. <laughs> now, teaching and learning, we have modes. Do you want to break that one down for us briefly? Sure, and we've talked about these a lot uh, in the past on this podcast, but we have you know fully online, blended, or sometimes called hybrid learning. Mm-hmm. Obviously, in person or what's called face-to-face. Um, and then we have all different nuanced variations along that spectrum of, uh, uh, especially since remote instruction, mm-hmm, which includes mm-hmm. synchronous, um, high flex, what we've called blend flex, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. and all of the all of the above in various combinations we've seen yeah. in the past year or heard about. Yeah, that's right. Now, kind of key, as I understand it from Jerry's comments about intermodal transport, are those those containers? You know, and I guess. I gather that those have kind of entered into pop culture more recently as well. I guess some people actually make like dwellings out of those containers and stuff, which is kind of cool. But I guess there's 20-foot containers and 40-foot containers. Um, So they're standardized, right? And they allow easy transfer between modes, modes being ships or trucks or trains and all that, easy transfer between modes without human handling of the freight inside. That's really kind of a key value proposition, decreasing the amount of human interaction with the freight. Okay. So digital teaching and learning, I I thought the kind of the closest analog to shipping container is probably the, what we might call the content module or module. Or maybe just content, but yeah. 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 And so I guess the, the, 
crosswalk here is that the the content is like the the contents of the shipping container, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. that can be delivered through multiple modes whether it's online or face-to-face or mm-hmm. blended, like it can be shipped, that container on, the, on, the, on a ship somewhere in the Mediterranean <laughs> or coming around the Gulf of Suez mm-hmm. or um, on a, the, a flatbed, flatbed uh, train car mm-hmm. uh, or on the back of a truck going down the highway. It's the same thing being delivered in different ways mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for different purposes. Mm-hmm. Now, an entire course could be shared or distributed via standards-based packaging, like common cartridge, but I tend to think the module tends to be the kind of thing, and we say content module a lot, but I guess a module can include instructions for the human interactions, like discussions or learning activities and all of that. As well as the assessment, potentially. Yes, that's right. Um, but the interaction-dependent items require a real skillful instructor, right? You have to kind of make sure that person knows what they're, what they're doing. Mm-hmm. I kind of thought, Tom, related to this module thing, I think reusability is a key concept in making this metaphor kind of work, right? And um, it's, you know, it kind of seems more resonant with the standardized shipping containers and intermodal transport. And here we maybe queue up the SCORM era Abilities yeah. for people who go f- that far back: reusability, interoperability, durability, affordability, adaptability, accessibility. Adaptability, maybe, right? You, ch- you move f- from one mode to another. That could be a thing. Yeah, but I mean, as you as you were describing this, uh, I mean, I, I can't help but flash back to my pre higher ed uh, digital sure. learning days when uh, you know we did a lot of stuff for the military and others and it was mm-hmm. all SCORM based and mm-hmm. we had SCOs shareable content objects yep, and yep. the idea was that they that they could be repurposed and reused and in different that's right. ways um, that's right and they and it had that kind of portability to them yeah and I, I kind of think uh, underlying this as well I mean this is sort of like a little bit like open licensing like Creative Commons licensing if you haven't addressed reuse hence the reusability, you can't really address remixing, that is, the intermodal stuff, right? If you can't share it, then it's hard. So here's another, um, going back to old days, learning object, right? That's kind of up there with the shareable content object. And and for the folks who weren't along for that part of the ride, here's a circa 1997. It's the shortest definition I could find for learning (laughs) object, because there's a million of them. The smallest independent structural experience that contains an objective, a learning activity, and an assessment. That's yeah. uh, Lallier from 1997. So that, that construct of, uh, of objective, uh, mm-hmm. learning activity, and assessment, that's the, the, the framework, the, the foundation of our Obojobo learning object development platform. Yeah. No, that's that's exactly that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I, maybe one final thing about kind of the reusability and learning object thing is Wayne Hodgins, who actually arguably um, coined the phrase learning object, had what I've always thought was really a, a helpful construct. He talked about reusability and contextualization being counterpoised. That is the more highly contextualized an object or a module or a course is, the less reusable it is. The less contextualized, the more reusable it is. And we were doing this faculty development thing uh, with some colleagues at a state college down south in Florida some years ago, and a faculty member was getting his head around that, and he said, he was kind of had a pop pop music culture background, and he said, uh, I think um, that that makes sense. Singles are more reusable than albums, especially concept (laughs) albums. And I'm like, huh, I always kind of like that. (laughs) Yeah, I, I like that too. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then maybe maybe one final thing is like standards and standardization, right? And we used to talk a lot more about that, maybe more around like the learning object and SCORM and, and stuff, but we still have standards in our field, you know, like Quality Matters Design Standards and IMS Global Learning Consortium Technical Standards. Mm-hmm. Um, but that common cartridge standard, all that kind of underlies our ability to to share our work. All right, so with all of that as a preamble primer, you want to tell us what Jerry actually said to us so we can talk about it? <laughs> all right, so here's what, here's what Jerry said. Um, at our university, we talk a lot about modality. 
Recognizing this term of art from my years as a logistician in the Army Reserve, I thought I'd share my observation about what every administrator wants but doesn't dare say out loud, intermodal learning. Think of a course as a shipping container. It can move around to its final destination in a multitude of ways. It can be on a ship with lots of other shipping containers, such as a face-to-face -face lecture class, on a train, remote, asynchronous, on a cargo plane, online, synchronous, or on a truck, online, asynchronous. All of these modalities have the ability to get your cargo along to their destination, and you can use them in combination or by themselves. Just like in the logistics world, the more often the container changes modalities, the more expensive it gets. But when you give yourself a required delivery date for your cargo, you need to be willing to pay for the additional handling. No one seems to want to plan for or pay for the additional handling for all their cargo. Once there's a crisis, we'll just hire expediters to sort it out and get it done. I think the shipping container metaphor is a good one for the times we are in. It's really interesting. Would that all TopCast listeners should think <laughs> so deeply about the subject area here. Yeah, you know? I, I'm not sure I completely agree with, with Jerry's um, framing. Um, but it's really interesting. I really yes. like the way he's thinking. The, and the, where I think I depart, at least in the way I could understand it, is I am thinking of the content as the thing that gets shipped. Uh -huh. And in some ways, I think he's referring to the students as... So like when he says that mm -hmm. um, uh, it could be on a ship with lots of other shipping containers, like a face-to-face -face lecture class. I'm kind of picturing all the students sitting next to each other, and, and that's the analogy. I'm not sure that's completely tracking with how I'm picturing it. Maybe I'm misunderstanding how he's, how he's framing it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure either. Um, and all metaphors break down, you know, the more closely you inspect them. But I was kind of just taking the fact that intermodal learning, the, the, the proposition there is, there's sort of a desire to be able to take an entire course and just move it easily, quickly from one modality to another. Um, you know, sort of like we move shipping containers. So in that sense, broadly, I, I'm, I'm kind of going back to thinking of the whole course personally. But I do think there's interesting observations here and there's clearly some parallels as we've already kind of articulated a little bit, right? But there's some differences uh, as well, like we said one already, right? Courses are less reusable or transferable to a new mode than parts of right. courses. Right. Well, when you think about like a repository, so we use Canvas as our LMS here, and Canvas Commons allows you to to reuse and share at various levels of granularity. And the ones that are probably the most reusable are like the, the self-contained assets, whether it's a mm -hmm. test or a module or something right, like right, that, right, you know? Right. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I don't know, I kind of think that there's more human handling, quote unquote, in course redesign than there is in moving a container from, a, say, a ship to a truck. And that human intervention is arguably part of what makes learning experiences human. And as Jerry alludes, human intervention to change modes is costly in terms of time and effort. Yeah, but you know, it's funny, this past year has um, really expanded my horizons a little bit in how I think about things. So let's just, let's just take a, a course that um, is blended, mm -hmm. but the online portion is synchronous. Mm -hmm. And a faculty member, there's probably less heavy lifting design that they might need to do. And I could be challenged on this because it's actually, I know you have been working on this a lot yeah. with a lot of faculty recently. But as opposed to having the, the online portion be asynchronous, mm -hmm. where there's a lot of design that has to be done, mm -hmm. at least up front, um, a, a faculty member who's maybe teaching in a lecture format, even using active learning strategies in a classroom, can translate that to a synchronous environment relatively easily with less cognitive load, perhaps, this is my, my theorem, um, than, than if that online portion were asynchronous, where there would be a higher cost of transition, so to speak, to kind of 
you know, use, use Jerry's um, metaphor. Yeah, that's interesting. And certainly that was sort of, you know, the, the modus operandi for the, the, the great pivot of March 2020, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is like, okay, what can we what can we do synchronous online? But, you know, we've certainly talked in these podcasts a lot about the the value of design and assuring quality and and consistency and reliability. And I'd say that's one of the maybe one of the threats of kind of transferring in that synchronous uh, venue is how do you ensure that you get consistency? You know, like, you know, kind of moving across it comes down to the the individual faculty member right i mean it's all kind of person uh dependent i do think that there are design practices that make changing course modes easier uh, for instance we've talked before here a different kind of blended we've talked about blended as online courses with strategic face-to-face workshops and we really mean asynchronous online courses with strategic face-to-face workshops. Right. And if you follow that concept, a fully online course could be moved to a blended mode effectively. Uh, and if the blended course were designed in that manner, and they aren't always, the transition to fully online would be much more efficient. If you started off with blended, then went to fully online. But the transition from blended to fully online often involves creating new content or designing new activities or at least redesigning face-to-face activities to be effective online. And so those are some of the challenges. Like if you really started thinking, oh, this thing that we're starting with is eventually going to have to be in a different mode, that might change the way you go about designing it from the from the get-go. Yeah, yeah. I think that's an interesting way of thinking about it. And, um, you know, even just going back to that to that example I gave of the the blend where the online is is synchronous, right? Um, if I can just really kill Jerry's metaphor, um, <laughs> maybe it's like the it's like the difference between having your shipping container on a train that's on a track that's going over ground, over land, um, but it's it's in a fixed direction and it can only go between two points, right? Mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. it's on a track. But it can Ooh, be fast. I see where you're going with this, I think. But then when you move it off onto the truck, you're still over land, uh-huh. but you add an extra level of flexibility uh-huh. because you can turn on the roads and do things. So yeah, maybe yeah, that's yeah. the blended portion where you have some, some geographic flexibility, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, but not mm-hmm. necessarily temporal flexibility like uh-huh, you would asynchronous. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like not that. Bad. If you put it on a plane, then you, you leave the ground entirely. You can go anywhere. Now you're asynchronous, baby. That's right. Maybe on a ship, too. That would That's be right. asynchronous. Ultimate I don't know. flexibility. Yeah. Maybe a submarine. That would be... That'd be <laughs> do we ship freight Maybe a you, submarine? you give one... To, you put wheels on it and let the, the, the driver drive that just around wherever they want to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, I think that's, that's... I think all that's interesting. You know, we're actually... It, real, real world, um, we really are... As you know, uh, in our flagship faculty development program, we're thinking about how do you effectively prepare faculty for a greater variety in modalities, and so we're wrestling with this, right? You can't overwhelm faculty participants with like, (laughs) you know, go through a series of learning activities that, you know, show us that you can design and teach in every single one of these permutations and combinations. That's not practical, and you can't just kind of say that you can be prepared for everything and only practice one thing. So we're trying to kind of think like the Russian nesting dolls. We're kind of thinking about, okay, if you design first, you know, kind of for the broadest flexibility and then got more specific, then that affords some, you know, some uh, logical um, kind of flow in the design process. And so... All that to say that remote instruction continues to yeah. <laughs> force us to think differently. But so what do you think about um, Jerry's core assertion that what every administrator wants but doesn't dare say out loud is intermodal learning? I, well, I don't know. Why wouldn't they say that out loud? Um, I mean, what, what they want is flexibility, right? Um, I would think. Um, I'm... I'm not sure the hesitancy to to why that's kind of so verboten, um, but, but it may have something to do with his particular context. I don't know what kind of institution he's at, um, where maybe it's uh, 
a much more of a traditional, I don't know, kind of like a liberal arts college kind of experience where maybe that's not the prevailing kind of sentiment for that kind of learning, online learning. But um, I, I do think intermodal learning is, is an interesting term. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, it, it's, we'll add that to the list of blended, <laughs> hybrid, intermodal, <laughs> high flex. I, I like yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and I do think he's right in that the more transitions you have between modes, the the more, whether expensive is the right word, or mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, the, the more design has to be put in. You have to think about those transitions. They don't just happen uh, naturally. I mean, I know that you've talked a lot, like particularly when, when you built out the blend kit course, you know, this idea of the mix map, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. how does, how do the each modes complement and build upon each other? Mm-hmm. So right. you're not, you know, you're taking best advantage of each one and that they right. work together in concert. Right. Um, it's the same thing, I think here. And, and if, you know, if you looked at the actual logistics, you, you can't, you, you need a crane to lift your your shipping container off the, mm-hmm. the train and put it on the back of a, of a truck and that you have to make sure that you build the crane or you have the crane ready. You can't just right. show up and have expect the content to get from one to the other without any sort of transition. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. And I do think it's it's important to think about, you know, was it, uh, was it Kathy Davidson from Haystack who said that, you know, if faculty can be replaced by a computer, they should be, uh, you know, because there is sort of this, this thing of like, you know, robo courses or that, you know, this kind of this fear of everything's just going to be commoditized and what's the value add of the, of the faculty member or the faculty student interaction. The reality is, you know, we've talked about this a lot. Our online courses are about people interactions and they're not just robo courses. And so that's, that's important in general. But then when we change modes, how do we, how do we amplify or reinforce, um, that human role in there, and then it takes time and effort <laughs> to to make yeah. design choices. I've been um, asked that question before yeah. about about you know should we be afraid kind of questions, and yeah. the answers yeah. are always of course not. <laughs> no. No. Add value and you'll be fine. Yeah, I mean I think yeah. that's that's true. Yeah. Well, uh, do you want to try to ooh watch this land this cargo plane? <laughs> Sure. Yeah, this big giant, what is it, a C-17? I, I don't know the military planes very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, all right, so remote instruction caused a, a pretty sudden shift in mm-hmm. course modalities for, for pretty much all of higher education this past mm-hmm. year. Mm-hmm. Going forward, we need to think clearly and wisely about the nature of course modalities and human roles in them as we seek to redesign or reuse courses across modalities. Yeah. As you have said, I will quote you once again, the future Ooh. is blended. Yeah, now more than ever. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. We're, we're going to be just kind of staying attentive in, in the months and maybe years, yeah. <laughs> you know, just kind Decades. of see, <laughs> figuring out the shockwave afterwards. Hey, you think we have a moment for a quick plug? Sure. You want to do the plug? Uh, sure, I'll give it a shot. Uh, if you sign up for free, Dear listener, as a TopCast insider, you get emailed every time a new episode of TopCast releases. Right now, that's twice a month. And you'll get show notes and bonus content right there in your inbox. TopCast insiders also get first notice of special events and connection opportunities. I don't know why you'd want to connect with me, but you might want to connect with Tom. Um or maybe producer Tim, and we treat your contact info confidentially and we don't spam you or anything. We, we we're, take that seriously. So you can sign up for free right now at bit.ly slash topcast insider. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash topcast insider, lowercase, no spaces. How's that? That's good. I'm a topcast insider. Me too. Yeah. I read them. Yeah, me too. I write them, but I read All right. Them. Well, thank you to Jerry for the awesome topic suggestion. Yeah. We, we really chewed on this one, and so that was fun. Yeah. Uh, thank you to Francisca yeah. for the cafe. Gracias, mm-hmm. muchis. And uh, until next time, for TopCast, I'm Tom. I'm Kelvin. See ya.